Hello everyone, my name is Andrea, and I'm here to talk, to talk about a bit uh, what reservoir engineers do with Python. Uh, I'm sorry I'm the only one uh, presenting in English today, but if you want a Spanish version, version, please talk to my wife. She knows Spanish much better than I do. So, anyway, um, next. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about what we do in general, what our reservoir engineers do, and then we have a, a quick walk to a number of libraries that we use, that, that I use at work, <coughs> uh, Python specific, and especially in number crunching uh, with NumPy and XLRD in 2D and 3D visualizations, and uh, some, some user interface and some automation and the, and the interpolation. And the presentation has uh, a number of samples for you to try if you want to, and you can download them at that uh, address. And you will see in some of the slides uh, a red rectangle indicating the name of the slide and uh, the name of the sample I'm presenting. Um, there is some, a bit of code in the presentation, but I will not go through all the code because we don't have time. But just to show you what, in what way I use those libraries at work. So, what we do, uh, basically we try to study the behavior of, of oil field reservoir, oil reservoirs, deep underground. And uh, we have many, many different measurements com coming from all kinds of instruments. We generate uh, seismic waves, we measure oil gas production, uh, we measure the temperature, the pressure of the rock underground. And then with all this data together, what we, what we do, we try to build a three-dimensional representation of the reservoir as a numerical model, which is a big three-dimensional grid with small cells, uh, divided in small cells, and we try to simulate the behavior of the fluid, oil, gas, and water inside this reservoir over time. It's a very complex problem because it's time-dependent, fluid-dependent, rock-dependent, and it's a, it's a very complex one, yes. Um, a high level summary, uh, let's say what, some of the problems we have is that the, the oil reservoir are, are found underground, between 1 and 10 kilometers underground, so we cannot go and see what's in there. We just have to trust our measurement. Uh, the, the, area, uh, the surface measurement in terms of area of the reservoir can be very big. You see a map of Montevideo there with one of the reservoirs I've been studying in the past. This is the aerial extension. So it's very difficult to model numerically because it's very big. And also the quantity of data coming from the measurement and the actual simulation can be very big. Sometimes we have 100 gigabytes of data just to process, to understand what, what the reservoir is doing, what fluid are reproducing, where the oil is going. Um, so the first task is, is fundamental, is to check if, if the, the input data we have, it makes sense. Meaning that with all the measurements we have coming from different sources, different uh, time interval at which they are taken, different uh, kind of data, um, most of the time you will find errors in the measurement themselves. Errors of transcriptions, errors of uh, the instrument, this kind of stuff. And if you leave these errors in, then the simulation you get out is not particularly good. So what you do, with pre you pre-process the data with some numerical libraries. You generate some visual representation of this data, which can be two-dimensional plot, three-dimensional surface, anything. And you try and spot the errors somewhere, if they are there. Once you clean them up, there are no more errors, in theory. And then the simulation is somehow more realistic. And the first one I want to talk about, uh, it's a bit of a pain because everyone at work uses Excel to store data, which is, uh, I don't know, it's something I don't like that much. But fortunately, there, there are libraries in Python to read Excel files. And my favorite one is XLRD. It's very, very useful uh, if someone stores Excel, uh, data in Excel or some of your colleagues, whatever. It's very useful, it's very powerful and fast, and it actually works around many of the bugs 
uh, that Excel introduces, which are, are especially related to date and time uh, issues. Now, mm, you see this red, little red rectangle? If you have the samples from the, that website, what, that sample I can actually run on your computer, on any operating system that I can think of, uh, using the, the XLRD library to read some of the files that you will find in the, the distribution folder I, I've given you. Uh, okay, that, if you have any question, you can stop me at any time. It doesn't need to be at the end. Uh, the second one, that's a bit more uh, meaty. There is more thing to do. Um, um, one day I've, uh, I've been asked to check all the measurements for all the wells. The wells are the, this thing we drill, we drill underground to extract the oil. And the data has a very high frequency in terms of depth interval. The wells we have are 10 kilometers long underground and the data is 15 centimeters per measurement. So it's a lot of data with a lot of columns. Every column has its, 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 its own, its own uh, measurement type. But we only care about two property. One is called the rock property, the other the content of water, how much water is in that particular interval. And what we have to do is to look at the data and discard everything that is less than zero or more than one, or greater than one, and then re-export this data in another format. First, uh, keeping the original depth interval every 15 centimeter, and then we have to average these properties every six meters. So two types of uh, exports, single scan of all the files, correct the error, re-export all the data in two different uh, depth intervals. This is an example of how the file look like. On the left, this is the header, which has variable number of rows. And then below, you have a, a series of columns with all the measurement. And in this particular uh, oil reservoir, we have 860 wells with almost five gigabytes of input data. And on my computer at work, which has this kind of specification, um, I set up a simple, relatively simple, script which uses NumPy, the numerical library of Python. And basically, on the, on the top, I tell Python, use uh, the load.txt function from NumPy, which read the text files, and load all the data in memory for one file. Second, I tell, the, the simulate, the, I tell NumPy, exclude everything that is less than zero and greater than one setting it to a dummy value, which is minus 999. Then once you've done that, save everything back to another format. And the saving use another very useful function from NumPy called save.txt, which resave the data in the same format you had at the beginning. And the third part, which is what? Not particularly interesting, but it does a moving average of, all the, of the data you have to move from 15 centimeters depth interval up to six meters depth interval. And the result of this is that uh, I can look through all the files in 6.5 minutes, which is not bad, but uh, I think we can do better. And one way I found it to do it, to do it better is to, is to go parallel. The machine I have has, uh, has 16 cores, so I can use uh, the multiprocessing module from, um, from the standard library. And it's one file at a time. It's very easy to parallelize. So you use, I use all the processor on my machine. And uh, for every file, I assign one processor. And I let the machine run. And although Windows is not exactly uh, multiprocessing friendly, uh, it gives a very, very good speed up. If you look at the, at the blue cur curve, uh, with one core, I can run 2.2 files per second, two files per second. With 16 cores, I get to 17 files per second. And I can process five gig gigabyte of data doing all the, the manipulation and everything in less than a minute, which is not bad. Um, after that, normally after processing all the, the input data, what you want to do is to generate a number of pictures uh, which shows this data 
for you and your, and your colleagues, uh, mostly for them to look at the picture and see if they can spot additional errors, because it often, it often happens. What I use to generate two-dimensional 2D picture to be plot is Matplotlib, which is a very famous uh, plotting package, package for, for Python. It generates very, very high quality plots, and it can easily be integrated in a user interface toolkits like WX Python, Qt, uh, PGTK, and so on. And I have a few examples here. This is one example plot we uh, I generate for my colleagues to look at. It just shows you the well trajectory underground, pressure measurement, the mobility of the fluid measurement. It's a high density plot because it shows you, apart from the uh, trajectory, it shows you how many reservoirs are penetrated in the in in the shaded areas, it shows you the characteristic of the fluid in that uh, orange table at the top, the 3D uh, uh, trajectory of the well on the right, the 2D position of the well on the left, and every point is colored depending on the kind of fluid is underground, either oil or gas or water. Um, I have a couple of examples here, I'm not sure I'm going through them, but uh, uh, Matplotlib allows you to have as many y-axis as you want, vertical axis. Uh, I showed you uh, the plot before at three vertical axis, but you can have ten, so you can plot multiple uh, variables on your plot, and you can actually color part of the plot depending on some parameter you choose in different color using this AX H span, which I use all the time. It just colors part of the plot vertically or horizontally, if you want, to just to highlight the data in a different way. And also here you have two samples in the internet address I gave you before. Mm. Another example is another way of showing the trajectory of a well underground. It shows you where the well is uh, actually producing in the blue point uh, well, the well is not producing in the red point, and the orange thingy represents the actual well trajectory. And uh, you have a table showing where it is producing and where it is not producing in terms of depth underground. You have 3D, 2D representation of the well trajectory, and actually a, pl a polar plot showing uh, how, how the well is inclined underground, the inclination, the uh, direction, the trajectory. Um, let's see if I okay. uh, These are other two samples that you have. Which they show you uh, how to put a table inside a Matplotlib plot. It can be hard sometimes because it's not very easy to, to handle tables. And how to put a, a, a polar plot in a, in a Matplotlib axis. It's a library that is very customizable and it's very uh, user friendly in general in terms of API. So if you if you are using uh, 2D plotting libraries, libraries, I suggest you I uh, suggest you try give it a try to Matplotlib because it's very powerful. Um, okay, I'll skip the use of this one. Mm. This is a short one on 3D visualization, uh, mostly because all the software we have at work they are ready to uh, most of the 3D stuff. This is what we do as reservoir engineers, as geologists. The software that we have, the commercial one, they do 3D stuff already. But we use some uh, very specific um, libraries for some very specific problems in Python and in reservoir engineering. And one of them can be double checking if the input data is uh, correct for the simulation, or I don't know, showing the simulation results for a particular well. And what I use for 3D visualization is BTK, the visualization toolkit and Mayavi. These are two libraries uh, that are available for Python. VTK is in C++, but it has a wrapper for Python. And let's see. One example. This is a, an actual reservoir mo numerical model in one of the reservoirs I studied. This is how it looks underground, the, the reservoir. And this particular grid that you see has 500,000 cells which is relatively big. And, but it, you, I have scaled it up until ten, uh, up to 10 million cells, and the interaction with the, with the figure is still very smooth. 
which means that BTK is a very powerful library to do 3D visualizations. Um, let's see this part. You have, you have this sample in the distribution called BTK1. Um, this sample simply shows you how to create a, a grid like the one I showed you before. There are special techniques to handle very, very big data sets, like 100 million cells. Um, this, this technique allows you to, to speed up the rendering on screen. Um, and there are also special utilities to convert between NumPy arrays and BTK arrays. Um, this is another example, a 3D visualization. These are actual wells, trajectory underground, and you see the little, uh, little balls, the spheres. Um, the colors in the sphere, they represent the, the kind of fluid you have in the reservoir. Blue is water, green is oil, red is gas. And the actual proportion, the, uh, the, the size of the slice of a, of a sphere tells you how much water, how much oil, how much gas is there proportionally. Every, every little ball can be clicked to show up more information on that particular depth interval, and you can do that for every well in the reservoir, and you can do that even time dependent, running a time simulation, you can see how the proportion of fluid change underground. This, this is another one, maybe less interesting, but very nice to look at. It shows a relationship between wells reservoirs and projects that we have. As what I mean by wells, reservoir, and project, wells is the actual hole you drill underground. The reservoir is the vertical section where the well belongs to, and the project can be multiple reservoirs linked together. And you can see a relationship between a well and a reservoir and a project in that way. You can distribute that picture to your colleague as a VRML file that we did. They can play around and see uh, where a well uh, is connected, to which reservoir is connected, to which project it belongs. And you have a sample for that. This is actually like a, a graph viz inheritance diagram, but in 3D. Okay. Uh, as I told you before, uh, the reservoir simulator uh, we use is actually a commercial product that takes our input data and runs us a time-dependent simulation over time and spits out a bunch of results. And the uh, result can be actually pretty big in terms of size, 100 gigabytes of results to analyze. And this amount of information is split between five and eight files. So each file is pretty big. And we can actually use Python to use this, to, to read this uh, binary file generated by the, the simulator, but the the most efficient code you can write in Python to read this file will still be slow. The, the, the advantage is that these files generated by the simulator, they are very easy in terms of structure, and they're simply big. So one way would be, can, can I use another language to read the binary file and then somehow use Python to use the other language to read the file? And actually, you can, because the reservoir simulator is written in Fortran, unfortunately. You can write a small Fortran routine that reads the result and link this Fortran routine to Python using H2Py. And uh, this is actually something I use every day. And H2Py takes your Fortran routine, pure, pure Fortran, and converts it to something like a a Windows DLL, DLL or a, I don't know, a Linux, uh, what do you call it, SO file. Um, it converts it to a dynamic link library, which is directly called, can, can be directly called in Python. So everything that is in your Fortran file is a, a function or a subroutine, everything can be actually, actually be accessed in, uh, by Python, simply, simply by importing the, the, the module generated by F2Py. So you write your subroutine in Fortran, call F2Py, you have a new Python module that does everything for you with the speed of Fortran. And as an example, I run this with three different compilers, Fortran compilers, plus uh, the pure Python code, 
And depending on the file size generated by the simulator, here you have 500 megabytes and zero on that end. Here, processing time in seconds. The Fortran uh, generated F2Pi module take between one and 1.5 seconds for the bigger files. Python, I don't have the scale there, but it goes up to 10 seconds. And for bigger files, which most, most of the time happens, around five gigabyte, 10 gigabyte, Python takes forever. The pure Python code takes forever, but the, wrap, the wrapped uh, Fortran routine by F2Pi is still linearly increasing. So it's still relatively fast. Okay, can I take this one? Okay, um, one day we had, uh, yeah, we had this basket of new simulation, 16,000 new simulation from the reservoir simulator ready. And uh, we had to read back all the results, which is a lot of data. 50 gigabytes per 16,000 simulations. It's a lot of data. And these 16,000 simulations actually were generated by changing 13 different parameters, one at a the time, then the, their combinations and whatever. And what we wanted to, to, to understand is how the results were changing when we change these 13 parameters, one at a time, or two together, or three together, and so on. So what I did, we, we used this F2P, F2Pi generated module that reads the, the result using Fortran, and then we use interpolation to estimate the results at intermediate values of the parameters, some combination that we don't have, or some intermediate values of the parameters, fractional values, combination we don't have, and we use SciPy for that, which has a multidimensional interpolation uh, facility. And you have an example in the distribution folder. And what you get, you condense all these terabytes of information into something that allows you to see what happens to the quantity of oil I produce on the y-axis if I change how the well are spaced apart to one another, or how the oil property changes. So you get different curves changing uh, by varying well spacing, the distance between wells, and the oil quality from bad to good. And you see results from interpolation in the middle from value of the parameters we don't have to extrapolation at the very end, where the routine extrapolates where the results do not exist. And this actually saved us, uh, I would say, six months of work, yeah. more or less. Um, OK, last part uh, about graphical user interfaces uh, is something that I, I like the most. Um, I, I love WX Python as a tool for a graphical user interface. I know there are many of them, uh, many graphical user interface uh, framework outside. By, by honestly prefer WX Python because the, the 2D and 3D uh, plotting uh, uh, libraries are easily in integrated into it. There are a lot, lot of uh, uh, controls you can use in terms of user interface controls. And the user interface, they actually look native in, a, in any platform because they use native uh, controls. And I distribute my user interface using uh, uh, Py2xe or PyInstaller and Lino setup. But one task of that day, or that month actually, was create a user interface that checks the quality of a calibrated reservoir model. What does it mean? We have observation from a, liquid, from, uh, from a well, which are the red point, and these are, for example, how much oil, oil has been produced for that from that well. The blue line represents what the simulator tells us from the simulation. Of course, they can, can never be the same, but what our target is to make the blue line be as close as possible to the red point, because that, in that way, our model represents reality. And basically, we want to create a user interface that shows this information for all the wells we have and calculates the error the distance between the red point and the blue line using this kind of monstrous formula and whatever. And the user interface should also allow the user to do many different other things like uh, filtering out uh, 
values, apply multipliers to uh, oil production, to how much oil you produce, uh, use different error functions to calculate the, the error between the simulated and the measured values. And one of the complications is that the number of measurements we have is, is gigantic. We have 70 ye 17 years of production with measurement coming in, I don't know, every day, every second, sometimes, depending on the, the, the data type. And uh, the number of wells, we have almost a thousand wells. So you, you multiply all these quantities together, you, you obtain a huge amount of data. And the actual user interface, okay, it took almost a month to create it, but it puts together all the power of all the library, libraries I've shown to you up to now and delivers something that looks like this. And uh, this actually shows a very condensed version of the information we have for a particular simulation. It tells you if a well is good or poor in terms of the quality of the, of the calibration, which means in terms of the blue curve is very close to the red point or not. It shows you how, how good or how poor it is in terms of percentages. You can make plot, you can export the data, you can let the user change uh, uh, the error function, change the appearance of the, the, the user interface, and you can get plot for every well and every uh, simulation and under multiple simulations. So basically, in the end, what you have is a user interface entirely in Python, independent on any other external uh, tool. And my colleagues can use it every day. We can compare the result. And the, the interface ex export for every well all the plots we need. And do it, uh, it does this in parallel. So generating 800 pictures takes about three minutes. And uh, the, the biggest advantage is that we have the source code of the user interface, so we don't have to wait for our commercial partner one, one year so that they get, they get, out, get out a patch for their code. And so in the end, it's a bit unfortunate that Python is not that, uh, that spread around in the oil industry, uh, because in my opinion, it, it actually improves your, uh, uh, the way you work at least 100 fold meaning that you can do things much, much faster than you can do without Python, for example, if you use Excel. And the beauty of the language itself is actually making my colleagues shift from other languages, like uh, Perl, Visual Basic, to Python itself. And the amount of, uh, the number of third-party libraries available, which I showed you only five or six of them, uh, I think makes Python one of the most complete languages, also for reservoir engineers. And of course, there are many, many more examples of Python, the use, of, the use of Python that I couldn't show you because of time. But I hope you enjoyed the presentation. was your programming background before starting uh, this Python project? Um, I used uh, MATLAB for um, one year, uh, Fortran for about one year at the same time with MATLAB. I did, I've done something Visual Basic, something C Sharp, but then I got bored. And um, uh, mostly because all these tools, they don't have the graphical capabilities of Python. I wanted to build user interface and there is no way you can do it with, you can do it with MATLAB and Fortran, but it's a pain. So I switched to Python, and I chose WX Python like that. Thank you. Yes? Uh, regarding the, the data quality analysis that you, shown, uh, you, you have shown recently, um, you firstly generate uh, an estimate of what th things should look like, and then compare to another measurement that uh, is um, afterwards made, or to what? Uh, no, the, the measurements are fixed 
over time you take some measurement and they are fixed and these are where the red dot on the plot the blue line is the results of the simulation coming out of our reservoir simulator what do you do if the blue line doesn't match very well the red dot you change some parameters in the simulation model not the, the measured data the measured data are fixed so you change some parameter of the rock or you change the oil quality somewhere or you change I don't know how the fluid moves and then you rerun the simulation and see if your changes are for the uh, for the better or for the worse and what what determines exactly if the data quality is better or worse than the previous run uh, you look at the distance between the blue curve and the red point you look at the square distance of this uh, between the red point and the blue curve and you sum up all these distances and you get what is called a root mean square error if this number is small it generally means that your match your calibration is very good if it's high it's not very good thank you well, Okay, I'm the maintainer of a mathematical function plotter, and I was interested about the matplotlib you are using in, the, the, in your program and project. Um, I'm going to ask you: Is it a good option for for Apply in a program that draws now the the graph from scratch and a way to solve problems like? Understanding mathematical expression, expressions and formulas, because I I had to do a, a lot of work solving bugs with with, uh, with expressions and etc. And so in your presentation, lots of uh, plots and expressions to to that. Can you say if it's a good way to solve it? You said, let, let's see if I get it uh, right. You said it, you're going to analyze some mathematical expression and you want to plot them on a, on a window. Yes. Okay, well, uh, normally this is what I do all the time. Uh, what, even, if, even if I have real data, the first thing I try to do is to find a mathematical definition for this real data. So if you have a formula or an expression, try and see what, how it looks like. That's by far the best way to understand the, the physical or the mathematical inside. And about the graphic options like show and high praise, uh, scales and that things? Uh, well, in terms of graphics, the library I use is Matplotly and you can customize pretty much everything you want. Scale, number of uh, ticks, uh, appearance, how the graph is big or small, the legend colors, point, a anything that you see in my plot, you can change. It's very, very highly customizable. Um, okay, thank you. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Hi, um, one question. Uh, do you try to apply some GPU programming to resolve this problems? Uh, number calculations, functions, and that things? You mean GPU? GPU, um, so NVIDIA. Yes, uh, I tried a couple of times, but you, my experience is that you have to keep the, the functions or the method as, as, is, as simple as possible because uh, uh, at least Windows, it was my Windows was very very sensible to whatever mistake you may may make, or uh, if the function becomes too complex, you get a blue screen of that. <laughs> so I try. It, it's a very good suggestion. Actually, the, the reservoir simulator we are using, they're trying to move from the CPU to the GPU because the the, the power you can get from that is immense. But you have to be very careful uh, on how you handle it. Okay. Thank you. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? 
Bueno, muchas gracias. Thank you.